Fancy, man. Long time no see, brother. Yeah, bro. It's good of Edinburgh to set up a Zoom call so that I can actually get to talk to you for once. <laughs> Mate, definitely, man. But I was, you know, I've been, I've been touching base with a lot of boys, you know, just high and by, see how they're doing, really. Um, you know, what have you been up to, mate? You, so you in London now? Mate, yeah, I've been here, been here about two years now. Moved, moved, moved here from Guildford um, sit, ever since retiring. Um, so just, you know, chasing dreams, mate. I have actually no idea what I want to do in life. So just, really? yeah, mate, I'm just, you know, to be honest, I'm just grateful that, you know, I'm able to do things I love without the, the stress of rugby. Yeah, you know? I know what you mean, man. I know what you mean. It was for me. It was a bit of a, it was a weight off my shoulders when, because I had the whole thing of building up to retiring, and finally, once I'd actually retired, it was a weight off my shoulders. The pressure of trying to get back, and I'd had concussion issues and all that kind of stuff as well. But I, most people have heard about that. So, I oh, mate, like, like like I said before, man. Like, congratulations again on your career, mate. Like you've come a long way, man. You know, and. You've, you know, the way you started, and like I said before, like, you know, you were just underrated, and then all of a sudden, sudden mentally, you just kind of like gear one to gear five, and you just kept at that pace for, you know, for a long time. And you know, even though I moved away from um, uh, from Edinburgh, and I was playing with Newport that first game when we played Edinburgh and Newport, and I was like, okay, Dance is playing eight, I'm mucking this guy, you know what I'm saying? And I was, you know, I was, I was hoping for a chance that we could like. You know, meet each other on the pitch, but it was just hard to get hold of you because, like I said, you know, you just you were you were a different player altogether. I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Thank and then you, you know you signed, you signed for. Um, uh, did you go to the Tigers first or Worcester first? It was Bath. I went to first. Oh, it's Bath. hard to keep track. Man, you, did you go to Worcester as well? Yeah. <laughs> man, you went. You were on the. You were on the around the block like me. You know. That's it, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had to just test all the waters, man. Get it right. Yeah, yeah. it's fine. I mean, too. It was, for me, it was about trying to find, because once I left Edinburgh, I probably didn't do the research that I should have done before I left. Yeah. And I think any time any player asks me for any kind of advice on those kind of things, it's just, you, you do research on the thing you're doing. And I think what happened to me is when I left to the Premiership, I potentially went to a club that wasn't right for me. I love my time at Bath, but the way Bath played just it didn't suit me at all. Yeah. Um, whereas Worcester and Tigers both suited me really well and they, they managed to get the best out of me. And that's, it's so important. And yeah. obviously we're both in, in life outside of rugby now and in business and in rugby is you need to find the people that fit your organization. And that was the issue I had when I moved to England is I went to a club that couldn't have suited me less in term, just in terms of playing style. Um, and, and I think it showed. Yeah. No, mate, I, I, to be honest, I've, I've always followed all the Edinburgh boys, you know, their games. You laid law. Uh, Nick Deluca when he went to Wasps, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, I just, I kept following the boys and, you know, because I knew you guys, you know, my time in Edinburgh showed me a lot of how the boys are so passionate about rugby. Mm. You know, like we were so underrated, like Edinburgh is always underrated, you know, and I, st I still can't believe how we made it to the semifinals, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was just unbelievable. Like nowadays, I was just like, how the hell did we make it up there? It's because... Mm the coaches, like, like, people give up on us. And as a team, we were like, no, we can actually do this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's when we came as a team and a group and then just started excelling from there. Um, but it was, it was sad that we all went separate oh, separate ways, but, you know, eventually that's how rugby works, really. You know? Exactly, man. I think, I think it's, some people maybe don't understand it and it's, it's, it's di professional sports is different because everything's in fast forward. You've got... I don't know, 10 or 12 years that you get to play for. And yeah. it's getting less and less as the game's getting more physical. People are getting bad injuries. But you've really got to experience as much as you can in that time. And I think both of us did. Both of us played for a few clubs. We had a great time. And I think, I think that's important as well. Like Edinburgh is my home club and I absolutely loved it. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity I got. But I also always knew that at some point, I knew I wanted to play somewhere else. I want to experience something different. Yeah. Um, and like you say, man, I have such fond memories of that. That was my my second season. But like you said, my first season, I, I hardly played at all. So my second season was that Heineken Cup year, and yeah. you and Greg were absolutely tearing up, and we were just winning and we're losing all the time in the league because they kept resting everyone. Like yeah. we're just gonna 
when I sent boys into the Heineken Cup and we kept getting these one point, two point, three point yeah. wins. Yeah. And it was amazing. Yeah. It was it was weird, man. Like it's you you look back at it and you'll be like, even though you think when people ask me, what's the greatest point of your career playing? And I would say that stint with Edinburgh when we reached the semi-finals, because we were basically underrated. We were basically, you know, just chucked away from everyone else. You know, we were we were we were positioned with Zebra at that time. You know what I'm saying, yeah. Um, and for us to come into the even even like the first two the the the, the, the most crucial games against uh, Racing Metro, those two games, like. The, the passion the boys showed was insane, you know, and, yeah. and, and the energy levels was just incredible. And then we went on to the, sem- the quarterfinals, you know, everyone was like, oh yeah, this is it, this is the journey done. They're just, you know, ticking the boxes here. And then what happened? We just act, you know, demonstrated that the boys were more, you know, passionate for the game than what the, you know, I'm, I'm not saying the coaches were against us, you know the coaches had no, um, you know they didn't they didn't think that would make pass to lose to lose who yeah. were top of the table. Weirdly, we you know somehow the boys just stuck stuck our heads in and just went for it. And you know we made the same finals. It was a different level altogether. You know, and my my rugby career, I've you know I played in Worcester, I've played in Newport, I've played in uh, with Hull Queens. Edinburgh showed me the the real meaning of passion in rugby. You know, the real meaning of of um, of wearing that jumper, wearing the jersey. You know, and I was just blessed I could be part of it. You know, an outsider. You know, especially like you as well. Like you know, you know, uh, from Zimbabwe. Like you, you know, you brought in something different. And for the boys to accept us and you know <laughs> make us part of them, it was just for me as an outsider. I just felt so home like at, like at home like if people ask me where would you move i'd actually move to edinburgh asap without a doubt if there was a job there for me but you know i i i love edinburgh so much and i'm grateful for my experience there and you know it got us in contact like you know like yourself like you know and all the other boys that we've played with and you know that's something that i'm always grateful for yeah for sure man and i i think you're right what what we had at the time and all the times i've been involved with any team that's done really well it's you have that thing you have the chemistry on the field and you have it off yeah. the field. And I think at that time we had such a good time and we were all, we were young guys coming through. You were what, 45 at the time or something? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> 145 and 45 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we lost the birth certificates in Fiji really young. So we don't know how old you are, but yeah. at the time we were coming through, we knew no better. All we knew is we, we put it all in on the week. We put it all out there. We trained as hard as we yeah. could. And I think for us young guys coming in, there are so many senior players in the group. I think, in particular, if you, yourself and Greek were two guys who played flipping well but worked bloody hard. I, I remember multiple times Boydie having fights with you to stop you training, <laughs> like, stop you going to the gym and things like that. And for us, learning that on the field was huge. But the other side of it is, is off the field, we had a bloody good time, didn't we? Yeah. Like, we'd play a game, we'd go out, doesn't necessarily need to be excess, we'd go into a bar, have a good time, like, spend time around each other and I've spoken to multiple players over my time at Edinburgh there were guys from all over the world that played yeah. it's the same with a lot of clubs but I think more so during our period there there were players from everywhere and when you're like adopting all these cultures and you're t- everyone's making way for different sort of cultures and that it's amazing and a lot of people I've spoken to said it was the best that they'd ever had in yeah. terms of the camaraderie that we had and it was I think that's so important. And like I said, and, and that's, that's what a lot of um, organizations outside of professional sport are trying to take from the games because that, that, that's what a, what a lot of people can learn and where they can benefit. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it, with Edinburgh, the thing I realized as well is, you know, this is, this is, this is probably you know, poking the bubble a bit, but, you know, some people might agree, some people might think it's, you know, it's just how it is, but, you know, in Edinburgh, there was no cliques, 
you know, everyone integrated with everyone, everyone mixed with everyone, everyone mingled with everyone. Like there was no hierarchy or lower hierarchy. Like, you know, that even the younger boys like would sit in the table with, you know, the, the, the most experienced players and just have banter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And there was no um, differences between, oh, you're a, a, you know, a junior player and you're a Lions or a Scotland cap player. You know, everyone was on the same level. And, you know, yeah, it was different on the training field because, you know, the younger boys wanted a place from, you know, to take over the experienced player's place, you know, but outside of it, that's where it starts. You know, yeah. people understanding other people's, you know, life and, um, you know, emotions and experiences, you know, because, you know, everyone has a different background, uh, a different upbringing, you know, um, and that's what we need to understand. And, you know, in Edinburgh, everyone felt comfortable because everyone was accepted, you know, like I, I felt like an, an outsider. I felt accepted. You know, my first, my first week in, in Edinburgh. You know, people started inviting me to their houses and cooking meals for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And for me, it was uncomfortable because I was intruding someone else's house, but it made me realize that they were, they were accepting me into their environment, into their culture, into their, you know, into the society, and making me feel home and you know, not an outsider. You know, and I think that's one thing that needs to change in a, you know, in, in the rugby environment. You know, there's a, a, a there's always cliques, and that's where, you know, a lot of differences happen. And I think people need to help others and get to know others, and you know, have empathy for others, and put themselves in their shoes. You know, you know, you you you, you probably. Realize this. When I was in Edinburgh, I was always a prankster. You know, I was always doing things. Now, 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 now I'm out of it. I realize, you know, maybe I've done something to hurt someone's feelings because it was a joke. But for them, it wasn't a joke. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know how they took that as a as a person. So I, you know, I feel bad. But it's 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 a, a, a learn, it was a learning curve for me to understand that, you know, I have to understand. I have to I have to put people myself in other people's shoes. You know, you can make jokes and banter, but can that person understand it is a joke and not something personal or, you know, emotionally? You know what I'm saying? I, th I think you're right. It's so in, in anything, empathy is so important, being able to understand how other people feel at any time. And I think, like we said, the one thing in professional sports in general that you get, it's, it's the same as anything else in life. What it is, is it's black and white. If yeah. you do well, you play on the weekend. You know what I mean? You, you, yeah. If you play well, you get picked. Whereas... I, I've only been out of rugby for whatever it is, almost a year now, but it, it doesn't seem like all walks of business are like that. Sometimes you can coast by for a little bit and get away with it, or you can do unbelievably well and not get your rewards. But what, what I've seen from my experiences is it, it, it is a, the, you get um, the reward for what you've done so quickly in sport, and it's something that you need to get used to is that it doesn't always come in things like that. And I think... The other thing you mentioned was, um, and what a lot of people are interested in is, obviously you want to do as well for yourself as you possibly can, but you're trying to, there's a, there's a whole collective goal that you're working towards and how you balance that's really difficult. And how many meetings have we sat in at the start of the season with different teams and all of them say the same thing. They say the word culture about 50 times. And yeah. We're going to be the fittest team. We're going to work the hardest. We're going to do all of this and we're all going to be best mates. But, Nine times out of ten, it doesn't happen. And I think yeah. definitely the years you were at Edinburgh and a couple of years after that as well, we had, we had that culture completely, whether it was by accident, whether it was by design. I think for me, the most important thing is a central group of people within the culture, not necessarily the coaches or the, the owners or the SOU, whoever telling you what to do. It's people embracing it on their own. And I think that's what we probably had. Yeah. How's um how's how's life after rugby treating you, mate? It's good, mate. Yeah. Well, I'm actually in Edinburgh. So I moved back to Edinburgh. Oh. Um, which has been amazing, mate. We've so when I when I retired oh, just after I retired, we so we were in Leicester at the time. Uh we just had a little boy, which was amazing. Congratulations, mate. Uh, Is he six foot three? He's a big lad, mate. He's a big <laughs> He needs to put on a bit of weight. He needs to go on the Fiji training program soon. Oh, right. 
He, uh, yeah, he's good, mate. So we moved up to Edinburgh. Leicester was just, I loved, mate, I loved Leicester. When I was playing there, I absolutely loved it. But a lot of things happened to us in that year um, that just created a negative space for us in terms yeah. of my retirement. Uh, my missus shattered her kneecap at the time as well. And he went she, through was, was it from a sport or just accident? She fell down the stairs with, with uh, our little guy. So oh. she was walking down the stairs. I just left training. Um, and she always pocket dials me. So she like called me uh, when I was on my way to training. But when I answered, she didn't talk back to me. So I just ignored it. And then I got to training and the team manager ran in and she was like, David Shelley's in an ambulance. You need to go home now. Uh, so I got home quickly and uh, the ambulance was taking off to hospital because she, she'd fallen down the stairs with Logan and to break the fall, she kind of turned away to protect him and then shattered her knee. So she was in a full leg cast. We had an eight week old baby. She was in a full leg cast for, for uh, eight weeks it was. Um, so I had, I was five nights, she was in hospital and I had five nights with Logan on my own. <laughs> I tell you what, I, I thought I was doing a lot. I thought I was doing a lot to help, but it turns out well, I wasn't. You know, yeah, you know, I think you in life we face things that test us as parents, you know what I'm saying? And I've, I've been in the situation, yeah. you know, but you have to just be grateful, mate. Like, you know, I'm saying, you know, they're both alive, they're both healthy. You know, it's just a, a curve on the road. Um, you know, and, you know, the most, the focus now is you and your family rather than anything else. Yeah, for sure, man. You know? For sure. Uh, mentally. How are your little ones? They're in Fiji? Yeah, they're still in Fiji. Son's 15. Not so little anymore. No, mate. Son's 15, daughter's turning 12. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it is what it is. Like, you just have to be grateful you have your loved ones around you. you know what I'm yeah. saying. And what, um, what's the coronavirus like in, in Fiji? Well, it's, it's, it's minimal. Really? Yeah, there's only about nine cases. Uh, no one has died. Um, so I think they, they, sh they locked it down real quick, which is good. That's good, mate. Because that's yeah. the way, isn't it? And that's, I speak to my parents a lot. Obviously, my parents are in Zimbabwe, and that's, a very densely populated area, and you just you don't know which way it's going to go. Hundred percent. I don't know what it's like, like in Fiji, but Zimbabwe, the healthcare systems are just that they're, they're pretty dodgy. If you can't get out the country, like we we were very lucky, and my parents have medical insurance that can take them out the country. But in this current environment, you can't. You can't because no way will take you. Yeah. You got coronavirus. You're on your own. You you stay in your own country. So I think um, it's it's quite worrying in. in in those kind of environments, but yeah, well, fingers crossed for the boys because it's like, you know, some of them are probably itching to get back on the field, really, you know. No. But hey, it's, it's a good break, though, mate. At this stage of my career, if I was still playing, I would have taken this as a blessing to take a bit of a break. You rest your body, get ready for the next season. Um, for me, I remember. The one game I remember really clearly was the Racing Metro away. Um, I, I remember it was a tightly contested game. I remember all three of the back rows scored. I scored, Natani scored, Ross Rennie scored. Um, and I remember Cheval was playing in the other team who was, for me, was, you know, someone I loved watching at school and I found that awesome. And then Goddard's hit the most amazing drop goal at the end. Yeah. Um, and there's no better feeling than having that... Uh, scoring at the end to win a game. You're behind, you score at the end, you win. There, there can't be a better feeling in rugby. And I don't think I haven't experienced that many times. Even, even the Toulouse game, we, we had, I remember, we had about 10 minutes of just pounding, trying to keep them out because we were already ahead. Uh, so I think that Racing Metro away game was pretty special for me. Yeah. <clears throat> I think for me, uh, <laughs> the turning point was... <clears throat> because I was out of selection um, the first couple of games because Rembo was being picked ahead of me. And you know what, he, played, he was playing really well. Like, you know, um, you know the, the game against London Irish, he was covering up so bad. And then he, he, he got an injury somehow. And in the week he was getting, um, getting tested by the, the physios and the doctors. And unfortunate for him, he didn't pass the test. Fortunate for me, I got selected. And um, <clears throat> that selection actually kind of like, you know, paved the way for me because 
it was a changing point for me, not being able to get selected in front of a young, talented rugby player. It made me realize that I should not be comfortable with, you know, playing at the position. I need to be, I, I, you know, I was signed to do a job. And, you know, when, and when Rambo got that, that, that in front of me, it was like an eye-opener for me. I was like, okay, this guy is going to play the whole season. At the rate he's playing, <clears throat> I think I'm just going to, you know, probably be playing for Melrose or Aki's or something. Um, but then he didn't pass the test for me. It was like, okay, this is my, my opportunity because if I don't play well, then uh, that's me done. Um, and then it was a London Irish back-to-back game. So, um, you know, played that game, played okay. And then we, you know, went on to Racing Metro. And I think everyone just stepped up the level, really. Um, and I think the most gutting thing is that game against Ulster for me. <clears throat> I yeah. think we, we were, you know, we were playing way better than them. We were, you know, we were attacking more than them. Um, I think for us, maybe we've just never experienced that atmosphere before. Whereas Ulster, they've done it so many times and they had the composure for it. We, we didn't. We were like, you know, quite frantic at times because we were like, right, we want to win this. We need to win this. You know, yeah. we've made it this far. Whereas Ulster, they were just composed. They're just like, okay, we'll play our game. You know, we'll break them down. We'll, you know, we'll make our yards. You know, we'll kick our goals. We'll score the tries. Um, you know, which was disappointing to look back at it. But then you understand. You know, Ulster is Ulster. They've they've made a you know they've stamped a mark on the on the, on the playing field, and they know how to cope with pressure. Um, and you know, for me, I was like, you know, that was the one time opportunity in in our life. You know, like, and thinking back, I thought, I think if we had made the finals, we could have we could have given Leinster uh, uh, the run of the money because the, 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 the style of rugby Ulster and Leinster played in the finals, we probably played a more attractive rugby. The way yeah. we, we were playing the rugby and, and the pool of players we had, but we just didn't have the composure and, you know, mm-hmm. um, how, to, how to withhold the pressure really. But you know what? That was probably the, the, the highlight, um, I think for me, was that Ulster game. Mate, it was crazy. I remember there were 38,000 people there and I swear to you it was as loud as any Scotland game I'd played as well. Yeah. A sold-out stadium. It was, it was absolutely, like people were just so passionate. I think also so many people were just surprised. I think we were a little bit surprised as well, but everyone to be there and just to take advantage of the situation. We're playing the biggest club rugby team in the world at Murrayfield in a Heineken Cup quarterfinal. And I remember the week before, you walk around Edinburgh, everyone's wanting to talk about it. And Edinburgh is a rugby city, but I mean, not everyone wants to talk about rugby all the time. But that week, everyone, it was like, it, the, the atmosphere was unbelievable. And the game was, was fantastic. Yeah. It was, it, was, it, was, it was good. Like, I think it was more relaxed than the pool games. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't train a lot. We, had, we just did more you know, technical stuff and more recovery work, you know, um, which was really good for us. But I think we carried that on to the Ulster game. I think we could have picked up a notch in training for that Ulster game, you know. Um, but, yeah, I think it was just, you know, the boys were, I think the boys were just so happy that we made it to the quarterfinals after being underrated and, you know, the underdogs and people had, you know, cut us off and for us to, sh- to prove that we've actually made it to the quarterfinal was a big thing. Like, when I was in Edinburgh, it kind of like drew me close to Laidlaw because I was intrigued and, you know, I was like, this small guy is really on the line. And for me, I was, you know, I was 20 stones. <laughs> I was, you know, I was, I was not making effective tackles and that's made me think like if he can put his body on the line I need to start making effective tackles um, and for me that made me realize that you know he's he's an incredible player and he's just gone from you know from level to level to level like like you know like um, David uh, well I think it's interesting because it's looking back now it's hard to imagine a time where Greg was ever overlooked because he's obviously a legend now and he's 
you know, yeah. captain Scotland so many times and played so many times. But it, it is bizarre when we, when I first started and when Natani was there, there, there was a period where he wasn't getting selected. It's, it's crazy to think that. And yeah. look, I, I think in any team there, there are guys who are doing the dirty work as well that just don't get the recognition. I don't think that was me and you, Nat, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do that much, that much of the dirty work. But it's... Uh, and, then, and like you mentioned before, Rambo was another one who was really highly rated coming out of the age grade stuff and then went through a period of not really getting selected as much and was forced to change position. And now you look where he's got to now. It's, uh, it's another fantastic story. Of, yeah. and, and another really hardworking guy as well. That's, that's what I think. Is there's, there's no mystery behind all of this. All these guys who achieve more than are expected or get to the top level, get whatever they do. They're all the guys that work the hardest. Well, it's not really a surprise for me, but I remember I, I was, so I came up through Edinburgh Ackies and I was always affiliated with Ackies. And I always remember going down to watch Ackies games. And at the time, Hamish Watson was playing for them. And the coaches never really gave him a look at Edinburgh. He was young, but they never really gave him a look in. And you honestly, you watched him play for Ackies. That guy was breaking like 15, 20 tackles a game. It was ludicrous. Uh, and then now he's one of the best at doing that in the world. He's one of the best open sides out there and he's absolutely killing it. So it's, it's great to see. For me, I think we'll go back to, uh, to Rambo. You know, um, like he's done really well for himself. Um, you know, from from the day where he kind of like took my position and made me realize that, you know, I need to step up my game. That's when I realized this kid has the potential, you know, to become one of the best players, you know, and, you know, even though he was quite small for an eight, he did an incredible job. You know, he did everything an eight would do. Um, you know, when they shifted him to hooker, you know, it was kind of like, yeah, you know what? He could do, do, do great things. But, you know what, the transition just made him even a much better player, you know? Um, so I think for me was was Rambo, yeah. Mate, Dance, I was planning to come down to Edinburgh for the August Fest, but I don't think it's happening anymore because I was, no. I touched base with uh, King and all those boys, so. But come, bro, come up, come up, mate. You can, we've, we've got a bed if you need it. Come up whenever. Because I met up with uh, Tom Brown when he was here. Yeah, I saw that. I saw on your Instagram. Yeah. Um, hey, I, you need to come up. We'll, we'll have, uh, once the bars are open again, we'll have a couple of beers. We can have a barbecue. Get yeah, it on. Yeah, Mate, for sure. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for your time. Guys, yeah, thanks for doing that. Yeah, God bless, man.